Emergency Medical Minute presents Mental Health Monthly. Substance-induced psychosis, the agitated geriatric patient, manic episodes, paramedics, nurses, mid-level providers, and physicians in the ED all regularly have to manage patients with psychiatric conditions, often with limited training and resources. In this series, psychiatric experts keep it real, raw, and relevant about what you need to know to successfully care for these patients in an emergency setting. Thank you all for joining us again today. We're lucky enough to have Dr. Nadia Haddad join us again. For those of you who don't know her, she is a psychiatrist who has expertise in both acute psychiatric care, but also related to uh, substance abuse and, and management. Well, so, you know, there's a ton of different topics that we could address regarding, you know, acute psychiatric issues. But with your expertise, I think it would be really interesting for us to learn about some of the issues related to psychosis, if you'd be okay with that. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah. So to start, I think understanding what actually is psychosis from, you know, your standpoint, when we when we use this word, I think a lot of times providers and, and you know, those in the medical specialties don't really understand what the definition is. So could you enlighten us a little bit on that? Yeah, I'd love to. I think it's such a great question. And, I, you know, one of the ways that makes the most sense for me to think about it is, you know, there are mood disorders, and I think that that's a lot more clear, you know, whether it's depression or bipolar disorder. And then we've got cognitive processing disorders, and that's where I I put psychosis. So psychosis is a situation where the way that we're processing our cognitions is not accurate. And so we'll get things like auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations. Uh, We can get delusions. So creating meaning out of things that are happening in the world that perhaps aren't true. We can get paranoia, which is uh, getting overly focused on ourselves as uh, being sort of at the root of conspiracies or being monitored. So those are sort of the most common manifestations of psychosis. Yeah, and I can say, you know, as an emergency doc and my colleagues who are EMS, you know, we see this regularly. And one of the issues that we have when it comes to psychosis is trying to differentiate psychosis that is underlying versus psychosis that is caused by some type of chemical substance. And so it would be great to chat with you a little bit more about helping us understand how to differentiate these things. And maybe to start, we could talk about some of the signs and symptoms that you would specifically feel are related to the different chemical substances that folks ingest or inject into their bodies. And so I would love if we could work our way through some of the the big ones that we see. Absolutely, yeah. Maybe I should start with a overview of what is more axis one sort of non-substance induced psychosis and then tease out how you might distinguish some of the others, although sometimes they are indistinguishable. So when we're looking at psychosis from, say, schizophrenia or psychosis from mania or a a severe depression, typically we'll see, in terms of hallucinations, only most likely auditory hallucinations. If someone is truly complaining of visual hallucinations, and this is like vivid visual hallucinations, it's typically not a underlying psychiatric disorder. I think tactile hallucinations are usually not characteristic. So hallucinations themselves, auditory, are most common in a psychiatric ailment. In terms of delusions, paranoia is very common, but you can get all sorts of delusions in underlying psychiatric. When you're talking about substance-induced, so uh, I think one of the most common we're seeing these days is methamphetamine. Is that right? Is yes, that what you're I would, seeing? I would 100% agree with you. Yeah. And methamphetamine causes gnarly psychosis that can look almost actually identical to a schizophrenia. So when people are intoxicated, or even if they've been using a lot of meth for long periods of time, even after they're no longer intoxicated with methamphetamine, they can look exactly like someone who has underlying schizophrenia to the point that if it goes on for weeks on end and you can no longer really trace it back to the intoxication or the detox from the methamphetamine, uh, we just start calling it psychosis. So when you talk about methamphetamine use and, and its you know, length of action, how long can we expect or should we suspect a person 
to possibly be psychotic from meth versus then starting to think about something else? You know, I don't think that there's a hard, fast rule. You know, the duration of time that the methamphetamine is in your system is certainly, if it's in your system, you can be psychotic. And so I think methamphetamine for most people is active for a few hours, you know, maybe eight hours in your system. But depending on your underlying predispositions, and this is where there's not always, you know, hard, fast rules, because if some, a lot of people who have underlying mental health issues use methamphetamine, feel like it's helpful to them because it helps to clear their thoughts. But if they have underlying mental health issues, and then you add methamphetamine on top, it can exacerbate and it does exacerbate the underlying mental health issues. And so you can get an exacerbation of psychosis for days, right? Or a week before their neurotransmitters start to write themselves. And is that like a washout period? Is that what you're describing? Or is that just the underlying use of meth? If by washout period, you mean the actual substance itself, I don't think it's that because you have mental health issues that it takes longer to clear the methamphetamine. I think it's more that the methamphetamine triggers, exacerbates the underlying mental health issues, and then that takes time to resolve. And what are some go-to signs and symptoms that we should be looking for to clue us in that maybe this is meth? Tactile hallucinations are super common with methamphetamine. People who have been using meth will skin pick sometimes or start to develop a delusion of parasitosis so that they believe that there's bugs in their skin, which is very distressing. I think those are probably the most common that help me distinguish methamphetamine. Is aggression a a big uh, common symptom or is that something that could just be uh, related to an underlying psychiatric illness? You know, I certainly think methamphetamine can cause people to be aggressive. And if you add that to an underlying mental health issue, certainly that can make it worse. I don't know that I would say that, like, if someone is aggressive, that I believe that they are more likely to have methamphetamine. But I don't know, what has your experience been in the ER? I think it kind of runs the gambit. You know, we get some folks that are significantly agitated, Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, outside of the norm and aren't able to calm, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and and then there's others that are just kind of docile, but Mm -hmm. obviously having these uh, tactile hallucinations that you're describing. So kind of runs the gambit. There's a few other drugs that we we could touch on real quick um, that I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on. So how about, you know, psychosis related to marijuana? What do you see with that? Yeah. So it's interesting because when people think about substances that uh, can cause long-lasting harm, I think methamphetamine is way up there. I think in, in sort of our general understanding, not a great drug to use. But we sometimes take cannabis and say, oh, you know, it's just like alcohol, you know, in terms of, you know, everyone can do it. It's not a big deal. But for people with predisposition or people who are using it on the daily for long periods of time, especially for folks under the age of 25, cannabis can lead people to develop schizophrenia-like symptoms and actually go on to develop schizophrenia or even bipolar disorder. So, you know, intoxication with cannabis itself, if we're talking about like substance-induced psychosis, Cannabis leads to a lot of anxiety and sometimes a lot of paranoia. I think it's the paranoia piece that we see most often with cannabis, more so than like frank hallucinations. What, what, what's been your experience with that? I think, you know, similar. You know, the one question I have, though, is do you see a difference between those that are eating or the edible um, use mm. versus uh, those that smoke it? What I would say about that is that the edibles seem to be more difficult to titrate the dose. And and it also takes longer to kick in. And so what can happen with edibles, especially with people who are not experienced or familiar with edibles, is that they can take some and then wait five minutes or however long, not experience much and take more, and then get themselves into a place that 15 minutes, the 30 minutes, whenever the edible cannabis kicks in, suddenly they're flying through the cosmos. And it's incredibly distressing. And so I think 
with smoking, sometimes people are better able because it hits much more quickly to titrate how much they have in their system. When you, I guess, compare that and we kind of move on to the next realm, you kind of touched on this, but is there an alcohol-related psychosis that you see? Yes, you can get alcohol-related psychosis. So alcohol intoxication can cause sort of mild psychosis. I wouldn't say that this would be a situation where they'd come in primarily, usually to the ER, solely for alcohol intoxication-related psychosis without some something else going on underlyingly. But where you see psychosis or psychotic-looking symptoms is in withdrawal. So, you know, delirium tremens can look like psychosis. You know, and in the ED, when you talk about that, we, uh, you know, we always look for some signs and symptoms, specifically tachycardia, hypertension, mm-hmm. uh, fasciculations, mm-hmm. tremors. Do you always see that in, uh, in, in, those, in that setting along, uh, if someone's in delirium tremens? Like, are you uh, on top of that seeing those other changes or can you have that separate? What I would say is that the hallmark of delirium tremens is a fluctuating, waxing and waning consciousness. Whereas in alcohol withdrawal, the peak risk for seizures tends to be 24 to 48 hours after your last drink. The peak risk for delirium tremens is actually 72 hours after your last drink. So what I will often see is the peak of the physical symptoms of withdrawal starting to fade at 48 hours or starting to, you know, as we get into 72 hours out. So usually 12 hours out with alcohol, depending on how much someone is drinking, maybe even less than that, six hours out from their last drink, I'll start to see sometimes really severe hoarse tremor and people will be incredibly anxious, very uncomfortable. Their heart rate is elevated. Their blood pressures are elevated. And we treat that you know, let's say with a benzodiazepine long-acting Librium Valium or phenobarbital. And then we think they're out of the woods and those symptoms start to get better. And then that peak of risk for delirium tremens starts to rise. And so sometimes what can happen is that we will think they're out of the woods and then they start to get confused. And so to answer your question, yeah, you don't necessarily have to have all the physical symptoms of withdrawal to develop delirium tremens, although I've certainly seen very severe delirium tremens with all of the symptoms of withdrawal as well. And we see a lot of folks who are chronic inebriates, like significantly mm-hmm. chronic inebriates, you know, so blood alcohol levels in the 300s or 400s, you know, that's their norm. Mm-hmm. So it seems that we should still suspect this, even if they may have some alcohol on board, as that is still not at their baseline. So so that's something that we should probably keep in mind. I love that question. I think some people, especially new to withdrawal, will think that If someone's BAL is zero, that's when we need to start worrying about it. Or if their BAL is 200 or 300, that they couldn't possibly have a seizure. They couldn't possibly be in withdrawal. And the reality is that, you know, I'm sure you see all the time, and I used to see, you know, BALs, people come into the ER, I'd get the records, BALs in the 500s. And for folks who are living at that level, their bodies become acclimated to that. And so they're BAL drops to 300, and they are in withdrawal. Got it. Well, let's move on to the last one of the of the most common that we see, and, and that's cocaine. And what are some of the things that you would say differentiate that from some of these other psychosis uh, episodes that folks have? You know, I don't know that I notice a difference between cocaine-related psychosis and methamphetamine-related psychosis. I mean, they're relative substances. Methamphetamine may be a little bit worse overall, but I think, you know, if you go hard at the cocaine, the cocaine-related psychosis looks pretty similar. What's your experience? I think I, you know, I would agree with that. And so kind of running through these different types of, of drug-induced psychoses just to Just to refresh that, it sounds like meth and cocaine, we can expect to see tactile type hallucinations, some agitation, um, and this can last for a period of time longer, maybe for meth than than cocaine. For marijuana, a lot of anxiety. um, Paranoia. Paranoia. And then alcohol, 
um, you know, depending on where they are in that withdrawal framework, whether that be after the 72-hour period, we can start to see more of that delirium tremens type picture. Yeah. And there's also alcoholic hallucinosis, which is hallucinations while you're intoxicated, but they don't tend to be quite as significant, let's say, as the methamphetamine or cocaine related. The last point I'll make is that if someone is complaining of frank visual hallucinations, not just I'm seeing shadows, which is pretty common, or in terms of auditory hallucinations, I'm hearing my name. Those are kind of ones that I don't think about as super frank psychosis, then I'm usually thinking about substance-induced or neurologic. Thank you all very much for joining us today for this first episode of a special two-part series. In the next episode, we'll listen to Drs. Ricky Dhaliwal and Nadia Haddad as they discuss the different treatment modalities for substance-induced psychosis. (laughs) 